All right, I would like to welcome everyone to our OER Project Presents sessions tonight. My name is Ebony McKeever, the Senior Engagement Manager with OER Project, and I cannot tell you how excited I am for our session tonight. It is behind the panels, or beyond the panels, excuse me, and we'll be talking to some great panelists and guests tonight um, who are currently working on graphic history. I also want to say um, for all the guests attending tonight, there will be a random, I guess, prize drawing and you all will have the opportunity. Well, 25 folks will receive a book from one of our panelists tonight. Um, and if you are chosen, you'll receive an email message within the next one to two business days alerting you to or alerting you that you won. So this is not about me today, so I will be quiet, but what I want to do first is I would like to read the bios of our first two, our moderator and our guest. So to get started, we're going to first introduce you to Dr. Trevor Getz. Dr. Getz is a professor of African and World History at San Francisco State University and an award-winning historian. His work focuses on history education, especially in the field of world history, as well as the social history of Africa. He is the author or co-author of 12 books, including The Graphic History of Bina and the Important Men, which won the 2014 James Harvey Robinson Prize. His work has appeared in the American Historical Review, the Journal of West African History, Slavery and Abolition, African Economic History, and Ghana Studies. Trevor has also written and produced a number of documentaries and historical films which have garnered festival prizes and has held visiting professorships at Stanford University and UC Berkeley. He is the recipient of the American Historical Association's 2020 Eugene Asher Distinguished Teaching Award. And we also have joining us Dr. Walter Greeson, a DeWitt Wallace professor in the Department of History at McAllister College. Dr. Walter Greeson is the preeminent historian of Afrofuturism, the Black speculative arts, and digital economies in the world today. Name one of today's Black history makers by the Philadelphia Daily News. Dr. Greekson has written more than 100 academic articles and essays. His work has appeared on Huffington Post, National Public Radio, and The Atlantic, among other popular professional and scholarly journals. He is also the author, editor, and contributor to 18 books, including The Graphic History of Hip Hop, Suburban Erasure, The Land Speaks, Cities Imagine, Illmatic Consequences, and The Black Reparations Project. So join me in welcoming Dr. Trevor Getz and Dr. Walter Greeson. Walter, how are you? Wonderful to see you, sir. Amazing to be in this conversation. Thank you so much for hosting the event and making an opportunity possible. Well, I'm, I'm really excited. We're going to be speaking to some fantastic, uh, you, you know, uh, artists and, and, and creators, the kind of people who are, I think, really revolutionizing the way we use graphic histories in the classroom, in our society. I want to talk a little bit about that in a while. But before we get to comics, I just want to, um, to, to talk to you a little bit about history in the public, because, you know, I, I know you maybe first of all, from the Encyclopedia of Black Comics, uh, you know, and that work that you did there. But, you know, one of the first things that actually I, I became excited about the work you do was the Wakanda syllabus. And you do all kinds of amazing work that is really public facing and involving public communities. So I just want to talk to you about uh, history for a moment, because history is, uh, I mean, you know, we do textbooks, we do monographs, whatever that is. We don't like to work in teams, historians, unlike some other scholars, apparently. And we and we write uh, we write scholarly articles. Um, why are you doing all this other stuff? Why are you doing uh, you know public histories and you know immersive web based stuff? What what's that all about? So we live in a world that's changing very rapidly around us, and as enduring the the methods that we've created over the last century to century and a half as a profession are, um, those methods need to evolve and we need to reach more and different audiences. And so while formally my main area is modern US history since the Civil War or the end of Reconstruction, um, what became really apparent, especially as I got deeper and deeper into African-American history, 
was the need to bring in different kinds of historical writing, thinking, and production so that we could reach and kind of bring in a fuller discourse about historical inquiry. And so that made me think of folks like W.E.B. Du Bois and the variety of work that he did, think of Angela Davis and the wide range of work she has done. And so looking through that lens, especially growing up essentially as a coder before I ever tried to begin doing history, um, it became immediately apparent to me that there was a need to create multimedia histories. And so I actually shut down a good part of myself to learn how to do monographs and textbooks and so on. But then the digital revolution happens in the first two decades of the 21st century. And it opens the door for me to take my base skills as a coder, as a computational designer, and then apply that to things like the Wakanda syllabus. And happily, that content gets picked up by, by Marvel Comics and then turns into something like the Black Panther film. And so those pieces reach many, many, many more people than my traditional academic writing. And so I would say probably the first time I saw it was the racial violence syllabus that I did after the Unite the Right rally online. Um, and that reached some 4 billion users online and got translated into seven languages. And that's when I was really committed to do more digital project creation, especially to incorporate scholarly history, because it takes too long for it to reach the public audience otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing that you it's amazing that you make that point. And that's that's I think a really important point. But I want to come at this from a slightly different angle as well, which is I know that you're a big proponent of students as drivers of curricular innovation. Can you explain that to me really quickly? So when I decided to go to college, I chose to go to Villanova University. And it was because at a college fair when I was a junior, a student who was recruiting for the university said while I was standing behind him that he loved Villanova because it had no Blacks or Latinos. And in saying that, I was like, there should not be colleges where people are out recruiting saying, because there is no diversity, this is a good place for you to come and attend. So um, I very aggressively went after enrollment at Villanova, won, won a substantial scholarship to attend. But every day I was there, I had just finished training with um, Oti Umalo, from South Africa, who was an um, anti-apartheid activist in exile. And OT basically inspired me to go in and to disrupt sites of segregation. And that's been the dominant kind of feature of, of my work beyond the classroom ever since, that students at Villanova had accepted a kind of secondary role in their academic experience. They were there to do what they were told and very little else graduate and then go into the world and be good and loyal employees. And so the work that I did as a student activist, the work that I had done as a graduate student, it was always about students taking charge of their educational experiences. And now as a professor, I can't betray that 20 years of activist work. So a huge portion of what I do, literally every class I teach is built on teaching students how to challenge their professors how to get more info beyond the syllabus that is assigned and to actually provoke them to create things that their professors couldn't imagine. Mm. And so that's been the work to kind of use, whether it's graphic arts or cinematic tools. Um, I think one of my favorite things is the collection of playlists on YouTube that I did back in like 2008 on hip hop activism, where the students all designed their own music videos about the, the songs that we studied. Um, one of them really broke through. I think it's reached over half a million viewers mm -hmm. as uh, something that was a student design project. Yeah. And so that work of empowering students to take charge of their own education, to collaborate aggressively with each other, and to push beyond the limitations of their instructors is, is the heart of, of how I try to approach higher education. Yeah, and it's so important. And um you know, uh, I, I want to, I, first of all, I just want to say, I see that there are some questions arising in the chat, and we're going to put those all together because some of our, you know, all of our panelists may have things to say about some of them, and we'll come to them uh, in a little bit. But, you know, for me, well, this is one of my favorite images, right? Um, it's from a Shoots and Ladders games, which unfortunately, my college students don't know what this game is. Like, do you not play this game? It's amazing. But um, it's from an actual set, and it's it, I love it because 
there's the kid who's supposed to be reading history, you know, which is our discipline. And instead he's reading a comic book and what happens to him? He shoots down to the dunce cap. Now, just really quickly to preface my question, when I was looking through the literature about comics and education, I came across a 1951 special issue of the Journal of Educational Psychology that was all about, you should use comics in the classroom. But then it disappeared, Walter, like not in Japan, not in France, you know, Belgium, but in the US, we said, nope, comics are not scholarly. Like what happened and like, why is it coming back now? I mean, how would you, uh, I'm asking you both as a comic person and an American historian. <laughs> What happened? Yeah, then? almost all the things I read point at uh, was it Frederick Wortham and and the um, seduction of the innocent premise mm -hmm. that um, asserts in really some some dubious terms that uh, comics are are the root of deviance and mm -hmm. that to engage in sequential art and reading in that way would take young people astray and introduce them to all manner of bad social influences. And um, that was never my experience. I I talked to thousands of folks who their literacy was dramatically expanded and improved by the fact that they read comics and, and sequential art. And, you know, of course, your work and the folks look back at a text like Mouse and just across all subjects in the historical profession, graphic text has been tremendously powerful for decades in improving the way that we teach, the way that students learn, the the wake graphic history is is spectacular, right. and yeah. so using the way that we connect these ideas to deal with historical topics, I, I even think of things like uh, Truth, Red, White, and Black that comes out that's a more traditional comic, yeah. but it challenges us to see the world in different ways, and that's that's the heart of of what we need to do as historians is that we need to communicate. Mm -hmm. How do we interrogate what we inherit as received knowledge and begin to kind of develop alternative perspectives, new questions, um, find new archives that can then shape the kind the kinds of history that can be produced long after we're gone? Yeah, you know, and and I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I believe in the different media each having their own contribution. I, I like a good scholarly article more than the next person, probably. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if we look at Rebecca Hall's work here, if we look at, you know, pages like this, um, and in the, the the ability of, of this medium to use metaphor as well as, you know, literal, the figurative as well as the literal, to connect different times. You know, here's a street in New York that's both 1712 and 2000, uh, to place the author there instead of pretending that the author is some objective person, to, to allow the author to place themselves, the, the artist, the creator, the historian, to place themselves in their struggles um, in what's going on and to do it in this visual way the only, the only thing that aggravates me is we've taught all the kids to read really fast. You know, you have to skim by the time you get to college. And I, I just want to say, slow down and really look at this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh, do you? That's, yeah. No, I was just going to ask, I mean, do you think that, and, and I want to get really quickly here to, um, to, your, to some of your latest work, but do you think that, um, that, that comics, um, challenge the sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess we use these words now, like democratize the classroom, decolonize the classroom. Um, there's one more D I can't think of right now. Um, but I mean, are comics a way of having students think about the sort of the meta of education as well as the content they're learning? Yeah, and that's probably the most fundamental lesson I learned. So I started teaching uh, pre-kindergarten to 12th grade before I ever came to a higher ed classroom. So mm -hmm. in, in the elementary, middle, and secondary system, I think 17 years before I started um, teaching college classes regularly. And so what I learned from doing that, uh, particularly when it came to like standardized test instruction and how do you get students to perform well, was the breakthrough was teaching the meta lesson about the test. Stop thinking about it as a stressful experience where you have to find the correct answer. Think instead about questions and how they're constructed. Learn to think like a test designer. And when you can internalize kind of the logic of the, the test maker, decoding whatever kind of standardized encounter you have allows you to excel in all kinds of contexts that, that lets you see beyond what the intended kind of outcomes are. 
And so by by empowering students, and you can do that with students as, as young as second or third grade, just beginning to kind of not accept the premise and begin to see the limitations of the way the problems they face are constructed. They're really, really good problem solvers when you give them the opportunity to use all of the skills that they've just learned before they ever enter the classroom. So right. these are the things that I find if we're not, if we're just about textual engagement and then how do you understand this structure of a sentence, the organization of paragraphs, those are all vital and important things. But when you're simultaneously decoding images as you put together and understand narratives and then the deeper kinds of analysis that so many of the graphic histories bring, that challenges their minds more and they're capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, when we start to talk about the next couple projects, layering music into the way that we interpret graphic art yeah. is a huge, huge just commitment I've made because I know and I've taught for years that when we use reading in conjunction with imagery as well as music, it's not just a powerful academic or educational experience. It actually challenges the students to do the creation of their own products. It lets them articulate their own vision, their own insights in much deeper and powerful ways. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to jump ahead to this page, which is a page that I really like in graphic history uh, um, of, of, of hip hop, um, because, you know, it, it was fascinating to me how you would capture that energy in in the Bronx or Brooklyn or later LA or whatever, you know, um, uh, uh, I, you know, and I don't know if it's, it's, it's a story that I've, I've heard and learned, but I didn't really know it at all until I, 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 I read your work, but you know, to get these parties and 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 get a sense of what was going on in these in these evening events and um, the way that uh, the music is created and to you know sort of visually present it, it's just it's just so um, it's so energizing. And and you know, I never want to say that engagement is the big thing about graphic histories because I don't think it is. It's it's but it's a first step. But but you know to put into visual metaphor the music um, is a pretty amazing thing. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this project and how it came about? So uh, you are the reason everything <laughs> kind of good <laughs> not, comes exactly. out of this work. Um, <laughs> working with at your introduction with the New York City Department of Education, uh, we had done a number of projects together. And uh, December of 2022, they, they came to me and said, do you think it's possible that we could do a graphic history of hip hop um, as part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary. And so of course, New York City is, is a huge site for hip hop culture and the way it, it developed in its early years. And yeah, the chance to produce something that would connect with all these students whose parents and grandparents were, were shaped by that culture um, was too good to pass up. I, I knew a really talented graphic artist, Tim Fielder, who he and I had worked on a couple of um, really amazing projects over the previous four or five years. And I knew that his style, his his commitment to the graphic arts craft would, would really work. And so uh, he signed on in December. Uh, we started putting together ideas and outlines in January of 2023. I think um, the script was probably done by the end of March. And then it was just us going back and forth over exactly the pieces that you're highlighting. How do we show the energy and the dynamism of, of the way people engaged hip hop at different points in time and at different places? Yeah. And there was also a big commitment to show that it wasn't just about New York or yeah. in the context of New York, it was also about the social history of American cities from yeah. the mid 1960s through the early 2000s. And so um, that was the piece for us was it was as a process, three different layers. Mm -hmm. There was a selection of the music that would actually represent the kind of social transformation that was happening and to put it in chronological context about just music as art. Then the graphic piece would come in behind that. And Tim and I would bounce back and forth about how many panels per page and which panels do what things and how do we put that all together. Um, one of the gifts that Tim really provided in the graphic history was showing people who were not always identified with the origins of hip hop, but mm -hmm. and often that had passed away. And so how do we represent them as kind of spiritual influences on the people who are still alive today? So right. um, building in backgrounds, 
But in this particular page, the thing that I, I love that shows up throughout the, the entire text are the shadowy figures of the folks who are dancing, the people who mm. are in the audience. Um, these It's really about all the participants that energized it. It's not just the people on stage. It's not just the DJ. It's not just the MC. It's not the graffiti mm. artist or the break dancer. Like, we invite this global audience of folks who love hip hop and have had their lives touched by it to see themselves in the text. And so um, I don't think you can see it on this page, but in, in the actual comic, Tim did an amazing thing where he created an animation in the bottom corner of every page. So that as you flip through the book, you can see a break dancer break dancing as, as you experience the story. And so there's just so many small details. The last layer is what I add as a social historian is just there have been so many books and articles written that most people would never see, but I take bits and pieces of them, key, key theses, um, key methodological interventions, and I build that into what works as a kind of social studies text at the 11th grade level, but if they're looking and following up on the pieces, and they are because they pay attention to the music, it then pulls them out to look at more scholarly resources which is ultimately mm -hmm. victory that, and we're doing two more volumes. So um, we raise the bar on each one yeah. so okay. that each time it gets a little bit more challenging and pushes people to jump into the scholarly discourse more. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm just, as I'm monitoring the chat, people are asking questions that I want to ask as well. And, and we're going to get to, uh, you know, some of these. I know we're going to lose you um, relatively soon. So I'm trying to make sure that we've got um, a little bit of depth with you before you have to go. But um here, here, here's the the main. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, because you know, um, not not just at, at the OER project, we've just done a sort of how to read a comic about how to read comics. Because here's what I'm finding, and I, and I love your reaction to this. On the one hand, our students are living in a visual world. They are visual experts. They react well to really visual stuff. Right? Fantastic. They can drive the way. It's a strength, et cetera. On the other hand, they don't really, they actually don't really know how to read for metaphor. They don't necessarily know, like that stuff has to be taught, right? So on the one hand, like creating a visual, creating a, a, a graphic history can connect with the world that they're in. On the other hand, there's still stuff to be taught to help them get everything out of it. Um, you think that's, that's a pretty accurate statement? Of course, of course. Um, the core of, of the work I do is about like, if you're going to teach music, you must incorporate some basic musicology. You mm -hmm. have to understand instrument, instrumentation. You have to understand um, the, the basics of how vocals are arranged. And so there's, it's uh, the work I have to do next after this meeting is largely about a group in Iowa that wants to learn how to teach multimedia literacy. How mm -hmm. do you teach not just how to read effectively, how do you, and, and to write effectively, how do you create music effectively? How do you then begin to write poetry more effectively? How do you create film more effectively? Right. And so having layers of literacy across different kinds of mediated experience, um, it's a vital skill in the 21st century. And I've actually learned a great deal from librarians. Um, wow. Librarians are so brilliant and, and to, to the same extent archivists as, as well. They, they know how to work across discipline in ways that they just bring, make it very easy for new newcomers to learn. And so that piece about challenging people, not just with traditional literacy, but building around it and deepening it, um, that makes for an extraordinary learning experience for these students. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, you know, part of the beginning of it is for them to understand that by and large, everything's a decision. Um, that the artist, that the creator has made. And if you can stop and like think about why was that decision made, you can learn something. I mean, so here, 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 here's uh, something, you know, coming out of your, uh, out of your volume, right? And one of the things that strikes me right here is, is the text, right? The type. I mean, you know, uh, how did the lettering get chosen? Why did you choose that lettering? You know, what's the choice there? And what's the choice of, you know, of red? And what's the choice of the juxtaposition here? of the two and you know what's the choice that why did you guys make the choice to make people look pretty realistic rather than really cartoony um like can you tell us a little bit about what you were thinking as you as as the two of you produced this 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 these two panels 
Yeah, so so Tim's art, and if you haven't seen Infinitum, uh, this is amazing graphic novel, also Maddie's Rocket. Tim has this piece where he can do really cartoony work, but he can also do hyper-realistic piece. And so as we discussed it, we wanted it to be something that felt more grounded as art, that it, it felt more biographical um, as we represented both the hip hop artists and the historic figures. And so the choice about how we put it together, say um, the graphic banner for 1968, Mm -hmm. What we're really trying to capture there is this moment before any of these students really can imagine how the assassinations in the first half of 1968 kind of shattered the sense of confidence and safety in the country, the, the kind of faith that we could mm -hmm. come together as a people. And, and it, it reflects in later art where we explore kind of pieces about um, Nixon's first and second, second, second elections and what kind of changes about the country through the late 60s and early 70s, and then how we still haven't recovered really as a society from a lot of that trauma. But um, in the depictions of King and Kennedy, um, we're tapping into, and we do this a lot, this kind of um, historical footage, documentary footage, mm -hmm. where we're recreating people's feeling about how they've imagined and seen an historic figure um, one of my favorite pieces is our first image about New York City, where it's a, a sky view of um, the Twin Towers. And we do this very intentionally because when we see it, it's just a very different thing to imagine the Twin Towers in the early 1970s versus when you think about it from our perspective today in 2024. And so just in the image and the way it's created, we're invoking this sense of loss and change and how do we understand um, both the good things in our world and the things that we have lost. And so Tim is just magnificent about kind of having the conversation and talking through the choice. Um, the red is clearly the sign that that we we were deeply wounded um, as a nation, as a world with, with the killings of, of both of these people. Yeah, and for me, I mean, this is the, for me, when I teach, and, and often when I teach, I, I actually teach a class called Teaching History with Comics as teacher education class. And, you know, our, the main thing, one of the things we do when we're working with a comic is we have students, I have student, each student choose a panel or a page and, and, and send it to me and we put it up and we look at it and we talk about it, right? You talk about it because everything, the creator made a choice. They made a choice to use those colors. They made a choice to use that typology. They made a choice in how they composed that page, Right. That one page, you know, has a setup and then it tells part of a story and has kind of a conclusion. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe there are no words. The art is a, a choice. And, you know, there's all kinds of language we can use to describe this. But for me, having students stop and look at pages is the most sort of important thing in learning how one should read um, a graphic uh, history or a graphic novel or anything like that. Um, boy, I didn't realize that I had so animated this particular page, um, which we're gonna hopefully move through really quickly. There we go. Um, you know, I was gonna ask you, I was gonna talk a little bit about some of um, these these pages that 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 show the way that time can be used and such, but I, I don't think that's a, that's a great use of our time. Um, I'd really love to bring in, cause I know you've gotta go pretty soon. I'd really love to bring in our three other panelists um, who can, you know, I think jump from here, this question of, um, how we how we do these things, uh, how we create. And th the question of how we create is really a question of how we should read comics. And the question of how we should read comics is really about how we should teach young people to read comics. So I'm really pleased to introduce uh, three other uh, great creators who I've been just huge fans of, some of them for a long time and some of them more recently. Um, the first is Tessa Halls. Uh, Tessa is an artist, a writer, and an adventurer, um, her essays have appeared in the Washington Post, Atlas Obscura, Adventure Journal, and her comics have been published in The Rumpus, City Arts, and Spark. She's received grants from the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, For Culture, and the Macmillan Foundation, and she's a recipient of the Washington Artist Trust Arts uh, Innovator Award. What I want to say about Tessa Halls is I got a, a, I got a preview of her, her new book, which you can pre-order, called Feeding Ghosts. Um, it is about intergenerate, much like Mouse, uh, in many ways, about intergenerational relationships, trauma, 
um, the way that history can manifest in memory and in families. It's the kind of stuff that I think we should be teaching in classrooms and it is gorgeous. So we're gonna look at that a little bit as well. And our second panelist um, is Stefan Manuel, uh, Stefan Manuel, um, who's the founder of True Fiction. Um, when I discovered True Fiction, I thought, wow, this is amazing because it is a comic education company that uses comics to teach about the history of marginalized groups. But it focuses um, on thinking about the students and their sort of culturally responsive lens, um, but also thinking about the communities that they're working with. Um, Stefan uh, learned about doing this kind of thing in the U.S. Army, where he designed learning experiences first. Um, his work is really just amazing for the classroom. And the third is somebody I've had the privilege of working with for a while. And some of you who uh, have seen OER project stuff would know Argamana, who's coming and talking to us at 5.30 a.m. right now, I think, from India. And um, he's a actually was a cancer researcher turned comic artist. Um, and his work, his early work was very much about uh, the history of science. Um, some beautiful work we'll see on famine stories, for example, uh, from India. He's right now the artist in residence, the first artist in residence at the Indian Institute of Technology um, and working there and teaching some classes I know as well. So thank you all three of you for joining me. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of stop my share for a little bit, but then we're going to uh, share again because I want to look at your work um, and, and, and discuss it a little bit as well. But first, let me ask you a couple of um, questions. And I don't know, um, can we highlight the, the panelists or pin them? I'm not sure how we do that. Um, but Ebony, if you- It's already been done. Oh, okay, I'm just not seeing it, right. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. That That's usually what happens. Um, I'd like to ask each of you how you got into um, doing this kind of graphic history work. But when I do, I want you to answer a second question as well. And that second question is, can you name a comic that you loved um, as a kid uh, or, or as a young adult or something like that? Um, one of my pet peeves, by the way, this wouldn't apply to any of you as historians who want to make comics, who never loved a comic. And I'm like, read some comics if you want to make a comic. Like, never make a comic until you've read a bunch and found some you like. So I'm wondering if I can start with you, Tessa, and just ask you how you got into this um, this business, if you will, into this passion, um, and also if there's a comic that, you, that you've that you loved. Yeah, thank you so much, Trevor, just first of all, for the opportunity to be here, and I'm so excited to be in conversation with all of the panelists. Um, so I had a very non-traditional trajectory to comics, which it's too much to explain, but basically I accidentally became a professional chef by way of being a college rugby player and ended up cooking at a science research station in Antarctica and made a studio under my bed and started drawing comics because it was a quick way to sort of capture the weirdness of the world around me. Um, but the reason that I got into it for Feeding Ghosts, the graphic novel that I have coming out in a five days, Tuesday, uh, I just got the full copies um, this past week, um, is because I knew that if I tried to tell about 100 years of really depressing Chinese history, it would automatically be relegated to a dense academic sphere unless I did it as a graphic novel. So I, I basically taught myself the medium to tell my family story. And uh, my single greatest influence in who I am, both as a maker and a human being, is Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. And um, for me, watching him use little red wagon rides as a device to talk like very seriously about existentialism and the way in which you go back and reread those, just the layers and the meta way in which you could tell he was working through some stuff. <laughs> um, I just think that they're they're brilliant and they stand the test of time. And um, I'm so happy that Bill Watterson has also recently come out of seclusion to do something totally, totally different. But yes, Calvin and Hobbes forever. Yeah, I read a Calvin and Hobbes every day, by the way. Um, Stefan, can you tell us about how you came to this, this business and this passion and also a comic that you've loved? Uh, I sure can. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, you know, my kind of first four way into this kind of started in a, a similar test in a, in, a, in a different place. Um, I found myself in Afghanistan um, in 2015. And, you know, that was kind of like the first wave of police brutality on social media and 
at the time, I, I felt that, you know, a lot of the freedoms that I was fighting for didn't always apply to people that look like me. And um, I kind of wanted to just know why. And, you know, I can make the argument that I had a great education. I was, I was fortunate to attend West Point. So after leaving the Army, uh, I found myself at a Northwestern um, getting an MBA and a master's in human center design. And I started running human center design studies on how people learn about um, social issues through the media. And people would always tell me stories about them experience, experiencing racism, homophobia, or misogyny, or something of the sort. And there weren't a lot of good tools for them to like kind of understand these moments in their lives. Their teachers couldn't help them. Their parents didn't really have good resources. And I felt that there was a great opportunity to use media to, you know, kind of help teach about these social issues um, through the lens of history. And um, when we started doing more studies, um, what we started doing was we're like, let's go find someone who's really good at, you know, teaching about social issues. Um, so we'd spend a lot of time with Black parents who would take their kids to libraries and we would ask them, what do you do around history to make your kids love themselves? Hey, and we just kept on asking these questions. And then all these, all these patterns came out. And then we would go to teachers and, and we would say, hey, teacher, what do you do around history in your classroom that's based off of fear? And we would ask white teachers, like, what, what are you fearful about in your classroom? What do you do? What do you don't do out of the fear? And there were like all these patterns. I um, mean, we tried to connect the patterns around what um, these black parents are doing out of love to what the, some of these the patterns that some of these teachers are doing out of fear. And we, we found some interesting things. And then we were like, okay, what medium do we use to do this? And um, we, we tested a couple of things and comic books was like the most efficient medium to kind of bring some of these patterns that we were seeing into life. And um, we have a whole framework and it's how, how we design our stuff. And my, my favorite comic book as a kid was a, it's actually a Japanese comic manga, it's Naruto. Um, um, and also Dragon Ball Z, like the original Dragon Ball Z content. Yeah, totally. I love them too. But by the way, that shows that you're younger than me because I know I'm, I'm on the oldest end of people who, 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 who love this comic. But by the way, Stefan, we're going to get to one of your pages first um, in, in just a minute um, to chat about. And so Arga, um, I'd love to know your story, especially since you come from science into comics. How did that happen? First of all, thank you so much, River, and thanks to everyone. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So, uh, as you know, like I was working as a cancer researcher. And precisely, I can tell like when I started drawing comics in 2015, actually. And I was uh, still working as a researcher. And in 2015, actually, I found two comics published, published by Science Magazine and Nature. So, like, it was my daily job, like, reading all these journals. So, Nick Susanis, like, who's, who wrote Unflattening. Yeah, so Nick Susanis published a 10 pages comics on climate crisis in nature. And 2015 was the 100th year celebration of uh, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. And uh, Science Magazine published a uh, comics on, like, uh, like it, this, it was a very short comics on the basic concept of material. So I was I wanted to leave actually academic research and wanted to do something in communication domain. Like I wanted to do, I was uh, getting more interest in stories of science. But the thing is, yeah, the, uh, these are the main influence like in coming into the comics business. Yeah. But then I found okay, since uh, when I dropped from academic research, I do not have any laboratory. So uh, how I can get attached to science? I found uh, history of science could be a uh, good way to do that because nowadays most of the library archives in all over the world is free, uh, at least some sort of. So I started uh, working in history of science. Then I found, oh, this, this is my like entry point to history. Then I found, okay, no, science and history of science are not isolated kind of subject, just somehow linked to the bigger history, like human history, social history, and other kind of things. Then now I'm doing more comics on that, this kind of history, not exactly history of science or exactly science. So that's how I started and now how I am expecting. And yeah, yeah when I was a kid, uh, my favorite comics was Asterix and Obelix. 
Oh yeah. yeah, me too. I grew up with the Roman Empire. It was it, it was also pretty well pretty well researched. I gotta say. Um, uh, yeah. But but it may be a little bit gendered because I I found very few women who um, similarly love those comics, which I think I was... love them. I love them so oh, much. I read. Thank all God. Of them. Okay. Good. <laughs> I worried for a while that it may be too male. There aren't as many compelling female characters, I have to say. But it is, you know, I mean, Hirsch, they had a really great, um, not Hirsch, um, Uderni and, and Gossini. They had a really great classical education in Latin and Roman history. So it's actually pretty accurate in some ways, which I think is quite funny. Um, Stefan, can we can we start by talking about these two pages um, from True Fiction? Um, because, I mean, I mean, first of all, I've got to tell you they're emotional. Right. And I, I'm just so interested in the idea that comics are about history with, you know, that is about people and, and faces and charisma and and, calm and, and, and emotion. Um, but also, you know, they're part of they're part of like really two very different stories, but they're, they're, they're part of stories. Can you can you tell me a little bit about these pages and, and, and how they were created and what they're for? I can. So on the page on the left is from um, a We may have lost Steph Stefan there. Um, I'm not sure. And if so, we can come right back to him, I think. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we do that? We'll come right back. Um, so... I wanted to uh, then ask Tessa, can we can we chat a, can we chat a little bit about this page from your from your new book that's coming out? Actually, it's two pages, right? It's a two page spread. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just, so just to give an overview, um, the the Cliff Notes version of my family story is that my grandmother was a, a journalist in Shanghai during the communist takeover, and um, she had written for pro nationalist newspapers, so ended up. Um, arrested and put through Maoist era thought reform campaigns. And so basically my book uses the scaffolding of her life story and her and my mom fleeing China to teach about basically 1927 to 1976 in China and in Hong Kong. So this is talking about um, something that happened early in the Great Leap Forward, where uh, the campaign to eliminate four pests were just these massive, massive nationwide um, campaigns to turn the countryside out to basically go off on one of Mao's completely scientifically unfounded crusades. Um, so he sent the entire country to kill sparrows. Um, and the reason that I wanted to, to focus on this spread is Trevor asked us to give a couple that really showed why we chose to do these as graphic novels. And this is something where if I had just written it, you know, it probably would have been thousands of words with footnotes. Um, but by showing it this way, I'm able to give the history, also show myself learning about it in real time. Like myself reading <laughs> dense Chinese history books shows up often in this book. And then I'm tying in how this was what happened to my mom and my grandmother as well, essentially, because my grandmother ended up losing her mind in, after what happened to her in China. So Basically, this two page spread shows how with a graphic novel, you can dance through time and perspective in a way that you can't in any other format. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was muted. Yeah, I mean, look, it's also it's, it's, it's also just two amazing pages. I mean, this is why your art touches me um, so much. I mean, first of all, I think the choice of black and white is just, you know, incredible. I don't know if you're ever tempted to do uh, color here, but I think it, it speaks so well. But secondly, these panels are so carefully composed. There's almost like a staircase there, you know, leading to this main story. And then you choose to have these these two really large panels. And the one really large panel is really, you know, it's, it's this dead bird. Um, and then, you know, the, the, your family's figures above it. And it's um, it just sort of speaks to the... I guess where I'm getting at, Tessa, to be truthful, is that for me, the one thing we leave out of the history classroom so often is trauma um, and the fact that we've all lived through trauma. And we should have great stories about joy and things like that, too. But we need to help students to acknowledge that 
we've all like we, we've all been there. We've all been through these sort of traumatic things, and um, that generationally it can kind of both connect us and separate us from the people in the past. So I just I really love these pages. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you you touched upon. Uh, so I, I was a painter and a writer before mm. I started teaching myself to draw comics. And so I think in some ways being fluent in other disciplines, and this goes back to what Walter was speaking to about, you know, mm. reading across different disciplines. I think it allowed me to, as someone not raised in the canon of comics, break some of the rules or think about panel layouts in maybe a non-traditional or different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the comic thing is to, to know the rules and to understand what is a panel? Why is it useful to have panels? What is a gutter? Why is it useful to have gutters between the panels? And then break that if you need to. I mean, even breaking it just with the with the with the with the, the pans and spoons and such, you know, where you kind of cross those panel lines. Um, it, it, it has so much and the leaves. It has so much effect. Stefan, let's go back to the pages that we were discussing when you got kicked out. Sorry about that. Um, so the, these, no two, <laughs> I yeah, I don't know what happened there, but these two pages that um, seem very different, but both also convey sort of emotion and 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 and, and movement. Uh, can you tell me about the tell us about these pages? Yeah, so the left one is about uh, it's about it's a story that takes place during the nineteen forties, Zuzu riots, and um, it's a story in the Zuzu riots. Basically, what happened is. There's this huge mob riot where Navy sailors and, you know, predominantly white LA community beat up any person that is wearing a zoot suit. And it's kind of like one of the big precursors to racial profiling in the context of US history. And yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's a traumatic story, but the other part of the story is just the culture of the zoot suits, the culture of jazz and joy, and the story of really just a young Mexican American boy coming to his own, and kind of the kind of you know the civil the sibling conflict because his brother is his older brother is like, hey, you should you should assimilate. It'll be safer for you, and the younger brother's like, I'm not going to assimilate. So. We kind of use the art here, Eric, in kind of floating as they're dancing in the context of like World War II, even though there's all this racial strife and allows us to really have like a deep conversation around, you know, some of the traumatic things of history, but also talk about the agency that people have had in history over time. Uh, even when there was trauma, there's always joy. Um, so on the right, um, this is a story we did with the uh, University of New Orleans, and it's a different. It's a story about a black woman liberating herself from slavery, and we're kind of using this metaphor of, you know, her being enslaved is in a lot of ways, it's like her drowning, drowning throughout her life. And slavery is really the chain. It's really her breaking these chains of pain is the sheets of paper around her, also pieces of information of that, that her master puts out. So she's just kind of all these things and, and you know we put these in you know, for a moment where you know the, the instance of slavery is kind of keeping her from being free and we may have we may have lost Stefan again but I just want to say you know, the economy of the use of words on these pages stands out to me, right? Because the argument is made here through art, not 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 just through text. Like art actually is doing work. And I just think, you know, I think that's such a, an important thing. Um, somebody just put in the comments, images are much stronger than words. And, you know, I mean, I think that they each have their own 
wonderful thing, but uh, you know, they can each do the, uh, uh, words. Words can make arguments very quickly. You know, um, uh, they're really efficient symbols, but uh, the art can just um, convey passion and things like that much more uh, effectively. Arga, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you've done so much work in so many different things now. now. Um, famine, famine Tales, when you sent me a free copy, thank you very much, um, or your published yeah, book. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, well, I, it took a while to get to me <laughs> because of, of American yeah, custom, yeah. I think. But um, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing book about a really incredible um, series of events in world history. Like most famines, um, this was a famine that didn't have to happen. It wasn't an environmental famine per se. It was a famine that was exacerbated by, you know, among other things, um, British Im or Imperial or really East India Company um, uh, 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 policy um, that, that made it so, yeah, so bad. But, okay, so first of all, hand-drawn style, so amazing. Your use of colors, so amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these pages? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, okay, so uh, let me first tell like about the project a little bit. So it was a follow-up project by University of Exeter. And the knowledge partners were the uh, India Office of British Library and Jagadpur University, which is a university in India. And so initially they started a project of uh, documenting all the famine happened in Indian subcontinent during its colonial period. So they started documenting every famine, the kind of archival material, they, their digital humanities lab, they were collecting the data. Then they thought, like for education purpose, uh, that kind of like huge material, it cannot uh, reach out to common people. Uh, they, uh, of course, there is a very good uh, digital archive they produced, but still, uh, that will be very tempting for common people to read all the research papers and other kind of archival materials. So then they thought, let's create a graphic anthology, and I started working on that. And uh, I, like, I would say, documented, not created, actually. So I documented uh, fame in which happened in 18th century India, in the eastern part of India, in Bengal province, where actually I'm from. I live actually in that. Region. So it's all about that. And that famine, uh, I started working on that famine uh, that like, like a scholar. So I took like eight months or nine months, just like a historian. I started reading all the mm -hmm. materials and I didn't draw any single pages. So here I'm just showing two pages, uh, which is uh, basically explaining how uh, British uh, uh, East India Company, Britain's East India Company's uh, faulty. Uh, land reform policies basically uh, was so bad that basically all the farmers they lost their land and they uh, literally destroyed the weaving industry which is uh, the best in the world actually at that time in eastern indian part and the eastern india at that time they used to produce a special kind of silk which is called malmal khas which is now extinct you cannot get that actual manual cost. That's the purest form of silk. And they totally destroyed that industry uh, because of their policies. This was uh, so what they did, uh, they started destroying one after uh, another different kind of artisanal industry because of their different kind of policies. Then they, they totally destroyed uh, the all kind of like labor laws at that time, what was available at that time. So then the economically, Bengal became very poor and uh, very, uh, I would say, vulnerable to any kind of environmental disaster. So, of course, the main reason behind the famine was scanty rainfall. Uh, so, but uh, Bengal was so poor that they couldn't sustain that. So, so while reading, uh, while drawing that uh, comics, I also took suggestions from Amartya uh, Sen's, Professor Amartya Sen got Nobel Prize in Economic Science. And he uh, published a book in 80s, in Poverty and Famine. So I uh, studied that book very carefully, like what is the exact reason of famine? So as per his thesis, everywhere in the world, across the history, famine is mostly economical and because of bad decisions. And it's all about availability and distribution of food. It's not about lack of. 
we have mm -hmm. enough food in the world to feed everyone, but its problem is how you are distributing. And, and another thing he pointed out, who is announcing that? This is a feminine condition or not? Because in everywhere in country, in across the world, in pocket, perhaps there are feminine conditions. But nowadays, if you go to the World Food Program's website, there are certain that rule that you can tell a condition as feminine. So, yeah. so who is deciding what is feminine or not? Who are who have food in their plate? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Right. Right. yeah. So, uh, and, and, uh, so I studied that that book also, and like that influenced me to document that history. So of course it was 18th century history, and um, I used watercolor because a British uh, artist uh, in 18th century, 19th century. A British British artists used to come to Indian subcontinent and they produce a lots of artwork on Indian landscape and society. But nobody drew feminine. So I was thinking, okay, so let's try like a British watercolor technique and let's mm. draw feminine. Something like that was, was playing in my mind. So mm. yeah, so but, that's the idea. But but what but what you're pointing to throughout the, the, the entire is the amount of research. That has to go into, you know, I mean, this is the thing that I that I learned about comics that, you know, when you start, I mean, because as a historian who always wrote text, I didn't know what people wore in 19th century West Africa. I didn't know how close they stood to each other. I didn't know. I mean, you know, what I love about this page in the center, in part, is that, you know, it's 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 in some ways it's it's almost like a technical diagram, you know, um, and and. And it's amazing to me the way you can you can do that with comics. And Nick Susanis does this in the piece that you described on climate change and such. You can put in a part. You can put in a map. You can put in newspaper. You can draw around it. You know, you are you, you can assemble a comic um, almost like kind of bricolage. But you've got to do your research about exactly. things. Yeah, um, you, you 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 can't get away with not describing what people you know wore because your people are going to be wearing things. Um, this is an exquisitely researched book um, and, and presented, I think. Um, it's fantastic. I'm going to come back to that. I actually, um, I wanted to, oh, I wanted to go um, here again. Um, Stefan, um, can you tell us about this page as well? I, I, I haven't read this comic and this page really intrigued me. So um, this is from a comic we did about um, the first great migration. And it sits in the, it's, a, it's really a story about uh, a young black couple who decides to, um, you know, leave the Jim Crow South for a better life um, in, 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 in Chicago in the North. And um, what we, what we, what we wanted to do is, you know, when we think about the power of, of the graphic medium, it can just say things that, it, you know, are harder to kind of say in words. So um, when we were doing the research with historians, there's always there's always talk about the push and pull factors of individual families leaving from Jim Crow South to the North from the Great Migration. And we kind of wanted to use the art to do that. So if you start at the left, the, some of the things that they were leaving behind were, you know, sharecropping, an economic system that was never going to support them. And then you go to um, you go to the center panel of the Ku Klux Klan kind of coming forward and kind of this triangle pattern. It's really like this Jim, it's a representation of like Jim Crow South kind of pushing them out. And then on the right, you see, you know, they're leaving their families behind. Um, they're kind of leaving, you know, the communities that they knew. And those are some of the factors in, you know, decision making. But when you look at the, the bottom panel, um, you kind of see this train coming out of the, you know, the horizon and expanding. And it kind of hints to the fact that the Great Migration was possible because of all the train lines that started to connect throughout the U.S. And, you know, the Great Migration, you know, people, it's estimated, you know, anywhere, anywhere for like four to six million, you know, mm -hmm. African-Americans left the South and, you know, transferred to all these great cities. But these, it's a, it's a, it's a leaderless migration. These are mm -hmm. individuals making decisions to live a better life. And that's why we kind of put this um, couple sitting on top of a train, holding mm -hmm. hands and the eyes looking at each other because at the end of the day, this is a story about just black love, like a couple that just loves each other, but it's happening in the context of like the great migration. And then 
you know, so we designed the page that way. And then we're like, okay, each panel, there's a primary source document that's tied to it. And, you know, I, I can get, you can get kids engaged here. And they're like, okay, let's, let's do a deeper dive into what this page is really talking about with, you know, this letter from a person during the great migration. Yeah, and, and one thing I want to note is just the way in which comics can, I mean, you know, we want to use photographs often for these kinds of things. And as you say, you know, some of this is connected to, you're doing your research from photographs and such, but so often there are things that are silent because we don't have photographs because people didn't think that should be photographed or, you know, that wasn't the, or there aren't many. And, and you know, you're using comics in many ways to kind of reverse that by creating the image. Um, where it may not have been. And I just think that's that's sort of so laudable. I'm going to stop the um, the presentation right now. I have a couple more questions to ask you, but I'm also just monitoring the chat. Um, the first thing I just wanna say really, ask really quickly, there are a couple of questions I think that related to some of you. Um, Arga, um, Deb Johnson asked, and this is the question I've asked in the past, is it possible to get famine tales in the US? Yeah, so we didn't get any distributed so far. So okay. if you write to Yadavpur University Press, they can uh, send it copy. Okay, you got to write to the university. That's okay. so far as that. Yeah. And, 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 and Tessa, Feeding Ghosts is going to, you can pre-order it, right? It's going to be available in like four or five days, actually available, available, right? Yeah, it's it's available for pre-order now and it's out March 5th. Okay. And I Stefan? Actually ordered, I actually ordered the book. I really want okay. to read this book. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to pick up my, my copy physically. Oh, wait, can I pick up a copy when I see you at Pegasus for your book talk? Okay, all right, good. That's fine. Um, I, I, I like picking it up physically. And Stefan, um, True Fiction, how can folks get a hold of the, the comics? Um, if you just go to our website, uh, and I'll put in a chat, truefiction.com, you can order all our current titles as of today. Okay, all right. That, that, that's fantastic. A few folks have asked questions about um, using things like Marvel Comics and such OER in the classroom. And I got to tell you, um, I, I don't know. I know that they are very protective of their um, uh, uh, IP. Um, and so I have no idea how you could do that. I will say that um, there's a lot of OER uh, comics material out there. Um, our one page is in the OER project to something. The Nib, have you ever been to the Nib? Um, there's, if you like the Haitian Revolution, Laurent Dubois collaborated on the Nib on a great comic on the Haitian Revolution. Um, there's quite a lot of sort of stuff out there. Um, I, I like using Marvel in, in DC in the classroom as much as anyone else, but I've never found a way to get around their, their lawyers <laughs> and kind of use it for free um, personally. Uh, before I go and ask some more of my questions that I have, if anybody has questions you want to ask the panelists, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I want to make sure your questions get answered before necessarily all of our questions, uh, all of my questions get answered. So um, I'll keep that open. And then I wanted to just ask um, you, while we're seeing if folks have questions, just sort of generally, all three of you, um, what advice do you have for teachers about teaching uh, using comics? What advice would you give them about in integrating comics into especially the social studies or history classroom? And, and any of the three of you should feel free to, to chime in first if anybody wants to take that. Uh, I can start. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, so thing is, uh, I have been teaching here uh, in an institute uh, called IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. I say like, Apparently, the most elite institute chain regarding science and engineering in India. So, but here we are trying to infuse humanities, like science and Indian students should read humanities, thing like that. So, what I do, my approach is, yeah, definitely, like they in my course, they have to read comics related to different historical and social issues. But it's a very practical course. Like they have to create a comics also as a project. So it's not only about reading, it's about also doing. So mm -hmm. I do not care, I do not judge their drawing skill. I mean, it's not a drawing class, I do not teach drawing. But through the process, they have to read so many materials, visual research, photographic research. They have to build their own visual archive before they draw the comics. 
So I have found this very useful in teaching. Right. So of course, reading is very much important, most important. You have to read before you create something. But creating part, we should add. Like, right? do not afraid about your drawing style, whether you can draw like professionals or not. But create your own comics, like kind of you are basically creating a visual note, not not for others, for yourself. Then when it, you are done, you can actually tell others also. So that process, if you go through, that would be very useful. That is my yeah, and, and I'm going to, just by the way, I mean, I think you're right that uh, um, that that making and reading are are integrated and, and you know, I, 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 it's making is, is a somewhat different conversation that we have to take on. But um, for me, I'm going to put in the chat, Nick Suzanne, the link to Nick Suzanne's education, um, Nick Suzanne's education page where he lists all the these lesson plans for making comics and it's spectacular. So everybody look in the chat. I'll put that up as soon as I have a moment. Um, Stefan, uh, Tessa, do either of you have uh, an answer to that question? Yeah, I, yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think I think the, the, the first thing is, you know, comic books are a communication medium and not a genre. And when you start moving away from just thinking about superheroes, then you can really think about all the ways you can use to, like, not even just engage students, but use it as a tool to drive, like, you know, the intellectual horsepower of your students, because some students are just going to react differently to it than this general text. Um, and, you know, and, and some of the work that we do is, yes, we create comic books, but like when we're writing the comic books, we're also looking at common core standards, mm -hmm. C3 history standards. And we're just like, okay, we're using this panel and this comic book to address this particular standard and this skill for this student. And, you know, when you look at the way a lot of Common Core standards are written or any standards are written, you know, they're, they're general in a lot of ways. So you can find a very interesting way to tie a comic book to it. And once you, once it's just not like, hey, a hook for a student, but it's like an integral part of the learning experience for a kid uh, or for a classroom, you know, you really start to unlock the you really start to unlock the power of it. So it just can't just be a hook. It has to be like a thorough process, uh, a thorough part of learning the learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I like especially that message. It can't just be a hook because it's because it's not, as you say, it's not a it's not a genre, it's a medium. And you know, you've got to like engage with the medium and really pull it out. And yeah, I know. By the way, I'm, uh, it's really impressive the way you think of this uh, in terms of curriculum as well as comics, right? And I know the third angle that your group always thinks of these things is in terms of community um, as well. So you've got curriculum, comics, community, three C's. I just made that up right now. Uh, I'm so proud of myself. Um, but um, I want to talk about community if we have some time uh, and talk talk about community production with you in, in a little bit. But first, Tessa, do you have any thoughts on this question of, of using uh, comics, especially your own in, in the classroom? Yeah, I think I come at it from a slightly different angle because I, I think I'm in classrooms less than maybe the other panelists. But mm -hmm. the process of of having students make their own comics, I think there's no better way to have them understand the subjectivity of history because it's embedded within the format that everything has to come from a perspective. Mm -hmm. And kind of looping back on what Argo was saying is, you know, you can't draw something unless you've done the research to understand the environment. And I, I think students very naturally start to realize the limitations of their own research and to understand that there is no such thing as an objective record and that every story you've ever read is a choice that someone made somewhere along the line. And the best way to really have them seep, have that seep into their bones, which I think is very important living in a basically post-truth world, um, is to have them try to draw an immersive world and realize how much they are crafting the argument that they're making. Yeah, that's really good. And so um, on, on that note, and I'm going to start with you this time, although you can pause for a second and think if you want, but if you were to give advice to a young person who wants to create comics, what would you, what would you say to them? Read Calvin and Hobbes. Um, but after that, I, I think research, um, it's wonderful hearing, Argo, you talk about that you read for however long before you started drawing. 
Um, I think for me, my background as a writer means that I think the writing has to be tight first, not necessarily a script, but you have to make the little uh, picture that goes on the front of the jigsaw puzzle before you ever start making the pieces of the puzzle. And so mm. I think maybe my advice would be atypical because I would say, get, get it to work as something that's not a comic before you turn it into a comic. Mm-hmm. Can I, can I, yeah, my process is same. Like, I completely agree with this. I do this every day. Yeah. But, do, but do you, but can I just ask the two of you, and, and then we'll move over to Stefan for a sec, but do, do you draw first or do you write text first? Or, or like, how, what does it actually look like when you're making a page? Is this working for me? Uh, it's for both of you, but yeah, I okay, please go, yeah. Okay, so uh, I draw first, actually. Visual comes to my mind first. Then I write, then again I redraw based on the text. So it's back and forth through process, but the visual comes to my mind first. And 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 I know you do you you're basically hand drawn, but is this all done on a tablet or is it actually done at any point on paper? Uh, in my comments? Yeah. Yeah, it's all all drawn on paper. It's, it's all you're all on you're all paper. Yeah, my drawing, I always prefer paper uh, and the deep need ink. I really yeah. love to hear the sound when you're scratching the ink. Sound. Paper, yeah. The sound I like to hear. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. And, and Tessa, what about you? What does your process look like? Oh, gosh. Um, mine is, I've, I would need an hour to explain that, but um, it is hybrid text and image and on large sheets of paper that I then go back through to find out what the focal points are. And it is, uh, it's controlled chaos, but it, it's not linear at all. And I think this is where my background as a painter and multidisciplinary artists uh, sort of makes me work uh, in a rogue and not recommended fashion. <laughs> Got you. Um, and, and then Stefan, you're 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 more like me. I'm not an art, artist per se either. And you know, when I make comics, it's a really collaborative act. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you work with both, you know, artists and writers, but also communities in in the creation of the comics uh, that you guys produce? Yeah. So, um, um, you know we have our own kind of little process where, like, we make our comic books in house, but something that we also do is um, we co-design comic books with communities. So um, in one instance, um, we worked at a charter school in Philadelphia and we were working with a teacher to turn like a Philadelphia story, well, a story about the Philadelphia NAACP during World War II into a comic book story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we kind of do is we kind of do like a train to trainer session with the teacher around understanding and making comic books and teaching or teaching the teachers how to do design thinking sprint. Um, once the teacher is comfortable there, um, the teacher will do the, the the comic the design thinking sprint with her students. Um, and the students, based off their research off of the moment in the history, they'll do all these design sprints. And then what we'll do is we'll take that data and we'll kind of put it into our framework to kind of make a comic book that can be part of um, their curriculum going forward. And really what we're trying to do is um, our take on a story and we think all stories are, well, there's there's like, there's a whole bunch of literature on like what a story is, but like to us, it's just a story is about somebody that wants something and they have to do some stuff to get it. And it can be, it's usually both internal and external of things that they have to do to, you know, eventually reach whatever goal they have. And how do we work with students to, you know, learn th- how do we make how do we work with students to create a story where someone's trying to get something, but it's in the context of the historical context of their community. Um, so we kind of kind we kind of just kind of create this process, and then we just kind of show them the steps that we're taking from you know a bunch of post-its on a wall to like a fully published comic book. And and when you're working with communities, uh, you know, I mean, part of the question that I've had. And I have this question a lot as I look across the um, as as I look across the the, the I, I read pretty much every nonfiction graphic novel graphic history that I can that comes up and there's no doubt that artists and authors from marginalized communities um, you know um, going back to Elton Bechtel right um, 
see the medium as a way to kind of, you know, create and write back and tell their stories. Is there is there some reason you think why comics is such a good medium for for that kind of storytelling, Stefan? Um, and anybody else can can weigh in as well. But like, what's the connection there? Do you think? I think it's a couple of things, but I just think it's. Uh, I think comic books as, as a medium just has this this efficiency of communication mm. um, that I don't think you always see it in other mediums because. You know, you can't really read a comic book unless you're paying attention. We have all been in a place where we read a we read a page and we don't re we don't remember what we read because reading is primarily a decoding activity. Um, you know, in comic books, you know, Scott McCloud talks in his book, you know, understanding comic books it's about the process of closure. And when you're reading a comic book, you're constantly making inferences about the connection between the panels, the gutter, the text especially what's not being said. And when I think it comes to, um, you know, untold stories of, you know, historically marginalized groups in a comic book, there's a lot that's being, being said and there's, there's also that a lot that's not. And mm -hmm. I think that representation just makes it, it is really like very visceral. And I think um, the second thing is, you know, I think when you're reading a comic book, in a lot of ways, you're kind of projecting yourself into the story or projecting yourself into like the main character. And, you know, through yes. that kind of project projection and feeling themselves, there's a lot of empathy there um, mm -hmm. that, that comes from like the reading process. And that's great for, you know, telling, you know, going back and telling your own story. Yeah. And I think that some of that is just sort of embedded deep in our sort of lizard brain that when we see faces, we empathize, right? Um, you know, that's why emojis work as well. But like we connect, you know, we, we connect and it becomes something that we can see through that perspective. I was really, really affected when Tessa said earlier that perspective is by definition, you know, sort of part of what a graphic history is. And that's that's true in both meanings of the term perspective. Um, you know, you're visually seeing the perspective um, and from the perspective of the people in it. Um, and and you're seeing the perspective that they're coming from. Um, hey, folks, we've got a couple more minutes. I just want to make sure that if there are any questions out there, um, they get answered, uh, either practical questions or kind of, um, you know, sort of more the theoretical or, 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 you know, philosophical questions. So if anybody has one, you can put it in the chat, but you can also raise your hand um, and, and join the conversation. I just want to make sure that we're open enough to. So Trev, I think there was a good question earlier on in the mm -hmm. session, and it was how do we convince our schools to buy graphic novels to use in classrooms? Oh, oh my God. Okay, can I tell a little story just really quickly? I was so proud of my little, my, my graphic history when I first uh, wrote it, and it went on to like, you know, do pretty well and and, and get some awards and such. An older person in my in my department said, oh, it's too bad kids don't read anymore. And I was so deflated at that very moment. Um, and then I really and then I realized that actually that was their problem, uh, not mine. But it is it, it is in some ways a real struggle that we again, unlike, you know, say, you know, France or, or, or Japan. And I think this is changing, but we still have this idea that if something isn't text letters in a line, it's not intellectual, or it's not scholarly, or it's not teaching uh, people to read. So so what do you say to the administrator? Um, what do you do? Do you show them all the prizes, you know, garnered by these books? Do you show them the research? And there is some research that, you know, there are harder words uh, per page um, uh, uh, on a, in a comic, and, and students are learning a lot. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists have a have a response to that question. Any any thoughts about what you would say to your schools or to schools to get them to see this stuff as educational? Um, I have a couple thoughts. <laughs> um, you know, there's I think there's always the always this thing of, you know, the, I think the the, the low low hanging fruit is you know how do you connect it to standards. How do you connect it to, you know, your district or your school strategic plan? So you're right. saying, like, hey, I am buying, you know, in your strategic plan, the superintendent says we want to do these two or three things. 
you know, comic books can be a tactical way of us addressing this thing. So you're solving multiple problems throughout like kind of the chain of command for administrators. Uh, the second thing is, and this is not, this is not research based, but I think about, you know, just the way our society is moving, you know, there, there's this interesting study that says, um, and don't quote me on the numbers, but in the 1970s, you know, maybe the average person saw like 500 ads a day at advertisements. They say today the ads is because of social media. We are constantly inundated with images and text on basically every screen that we consume. And so are the children. Give the kids an iPad just so they can, you know, they can sit down. <laughs> So the reality is we live in a world that is image image based and video based. And if our education system does not come to come to terms with that, we're losing an opportunity to educate the kids for the future based on the reality of their lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think it's like, you know, the, the old thinking is not working. We know it's not working. Um, so, you know, what else are you going to do? Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think allied to that is the idea that, um, as you say, kids are bombarded by images. Let's teach them how to think about an image, right? Let's teach them to stop and look at an image and analyze it as a, as, as a choice. And, you know, what, and what kind of message is it trying to convey rather than, you know, I mean, when we exclude things from the classroom, because we say we're not scholarly, what we're really saying to students is we're not going to teach you to deal with that stuff. Right. We're, 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 you know, go, and it means that they're going to, you know, be looking at that in naive ways. And, you know, if that's what they're going to be encountering all the time and they've never learned how to uh, really read it and, and think about it and read it with the grain for what the author intended and read it against the grain to see what the hidden messages are, um, then they're unequipped to be in that world. Um, and uh, I don't want to send kids out so that they're only equipped to read, you know, a short article that's tertiary history because it's part of the textbook um they're never going to encounter that in the world so let, let's teach them how to read things they are going to encounter in intellectual ways i would say so yeah that is a really good question um and somebody pointed to tim smith's books um i find that his his, his work is a little bit more convincing to sort of elementary and middle school um that's where he's coming from a little bit more than than, than high school teachers but i think I think he's really been a great advocate and I, I really, you know, appreciate um, uh, his publications on this topic. And I'll just say, just by the way, that, that there is more research starting up now on comics and literacy, but, you know, um, it, it's early days in the U.S. at least so far. Any other questions for our panelists? There was another one about what are the ways or characteristics that you can identify a good historical graphic novel? Oh my God, I can't answer this question because I'm too opinionated. I have huge opinions. I think that there's a lot of really crummy graphic histories out there, I gotta tell you. Obviously, none of them are in this room, right? These are, these are people who are producing really high quality stuff. Um, anybody wanna talk about what you think a good graphic history um, and, and, and if you think it would be impolitic to do that, I understand. But um, any any ideas about what you would look for? Yeah, I could jump in on that. I mean, yeah. going back to your earlier point about historians who decide to draw comics without understanding the medium. I think if you open up something and you can immediately tell that somebody was coming from an angle of, oh, if we make this a comic, kids will read it without giving thought to the format. Like you you can tell immediately. Yeah. So if you see something, you open it, it doesn't look like a dynamic, engaging comic, just close it immediately. Because if it's not interesting to you, the students aren't going to be drawn into it. And so I think that's the first litmus test. And then sit down and read it. I, I think it's it's easy immediately to know whether or not a work is going to draw you into its world. And that's what's going to cause student engagement is something that really leads into the fact that history is told from a human perspective. Um, and I'm sure the other panelists will be able to speak more to the academic side. Yeah, but I, I but I want to just appreciate that response for a second, because um, if it's not a good comic, who, who, who cares if it's good history in a way, right? If it's just illustrated history, there's a, 
there are some there are some um, things that present themselves as graphic histories where every single page is nine panels, right? One panel, two panel, three panel, four panel, five panel, six panel, seven panel, eight panel, nine panel. It's made no attempt to like take advantage of the the way that you know um, metaphor and space and time can be played within a comic. It's just an illustrated story, right, of, of a history. That's not a good comic. Um, and, and because of that, it's not communicating using the art. It's just communicating using the text. And um, then, then why choose the genre? Why choose the, why choose the medium if, if that's what you're going to do? Um, Stefan or Arga, any thoughts on this, on this question? Um, I, can, I can jump in. Um, to, to kind of test this point, Sometimes you can just open the book and you can see the word, the pictures and the words fighting each other. If it looks like the pictures and the words are fighting each other, you can tell that, you know, the artist and the writer, they were just doing their own thing and they didn't make, they didn't pay any attention to integrating the two. You can often see this when the, the word bubbles are like all over the art and they cut out some major pieces of the art. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's kind of one of my personal things, but I, another way to frame it is if you're an educator, you, you're, you're using the comic books as a tool to do a particular job. And if you know what that job is in your classroom, you should just look at the page and say, can this page do one of these four or five things? If it can't, then it's no good. It's not that it's even a good or bad graphic novel for history. It's just that it's not going to help you do the things that you need. It's not going to help you do the things in the classroom that you need to help your students with. And it's as yeah. simple as that. It's just, cut, cut, it's, it's just pretty cut and dry. Yeah. See, that's a much more mature response than mine because, you know, my part of my part of my response is if if you can't, if your students can't take pictures of some panel or some page and say, I love this panel or I love this page, the art speaks to me and I want to analyze it and I want to figure out why this panel was done in this way and what it's intended to communicate. Then, then, then it's not a it, it it's not good, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Like that's what I want my students to do. I want them to like want to analyze, want to pull apart, want to think deeply about um, a page and how and why it was constructed. Um, Arga, you'll get the last word uh, if you if you have any anything. Yeah, to like um, I answered it in line with your thought. Like uh, like one, two, three, four. That's kind of just illustrated text and just accompanying image uh, if you're finding in any comics book uh, like yeah this is okay for like perhaps nine panel read introduced by Alan Moore uh, but this is very good but yeah comics is more than illustrated text like we can explore more so there are so many good books where we can found this kind of experimentation uh, like in fact like Alan Moore's own short comics on information on uh, mm -hmm. after 9-11 so that's so metaphorical and uh, it's again nine panel read, but yet within the panel, uh, what was drawn is very metaphorical. So that's not exactly illustrated text. That's a completely different thing. And uh, the shadows of not our by us people and that illustrated essays, that, that yeah. word book. Yeah, um, again on nine eleven, I found very uh, like as a learning material. I used that book actually to learn learn about the craft of the book. It's like how to go beyond that, uh, uh, that panels, gutters, this kind of bondage you like. You can go out of that. So uh, I found this kind of books uh, very useful and I slowly try to use this kind of tool in my comics also. Yeah. I, I particularly follow this kind of things, how they use the medium uh, as a tool of experimentation, not just illustrative text. Yeah. I'm I'm really glad that you know just to finish off that that um, Ebony just chose to to share our our three close reads for graphic biographies. Just by the way, you know, as a classroom tool, um, I really I, I we really worked with a lot of teachers to develop that little, this little sheet, um, and just in this one little one page with a with a, with, a, with a little bit of back, students can use it to kind of talk about how a comic page or a comic book or or even a panel makes an argument and that to me that's the key slow down slow them down slow your students down and have them really think 
They can speed up and do a you know survey through you know the Atlantic revolutions next week. This week, slow them down for a moment. And and on that note, um, I'm going to say thank you to everybody very very much. Oh, thanks Deb for endorsing the activity. Um, thanks, uh, thank you to everybody very very much. Thank you, um, Walter Greeson. Of course, had to leave because um, he's in such high demand. He's making multiple talks a day, uh, but. Thank you to our three panelists who have made wonderful comment uh, comics, um, Tessa, Arga, Stefan. Thank you very much for taking your time to join us tonight. And thank you for all of you uh, for, for joining us as well. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Ebony, is there anything I'm supposed to say at the end? Thank no, you. you covered it. We'll thank everyone. Yeah. Well, also, again, there's the book giveaway. So our 25 lucky recipients They'll know um, with between tomorrow and Monday who it was, and then we'll get their contact information from there. And that's it. All right. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone. And really, the three of you, thank you so much thank for you. doing this. Yeah, great. we really appreciate it.